So I am Hannah. I have been married to John for a while now. And we, <laughs> we moved to Liverpool just over three years ago and absolutely love the city. And I do have two cats. I do have a picture. As a cat lover, if someone told me they had cats and didn't show me a picture, I'd be mad. So that's my justification. Black cat is Hudson. She is the love of my life. Eric is a pain, but we love her anyway. She teaches me the grace of God on the daily. Um, so yeah, we can take them down so I don't get too distracted. As part of my job here at church as community outreach, I take a team of people into the local asylum seeker accommodation every Tuesday afternoon. We serve drinks, we give snacks, and we chat to them. But hand on heart, I wish every single asylum seeker would get out of the country. I am quite honestly absolutely sick of asylum seekers. Bear with me. <laughs> I am sick of capable, educated, and willing individuals having the right to work taken away from them, whilst they are looked down upon by many on society for scrounging off our taxes when they are given pittance to live off. I am sick of people living in dirty, subpar, and often dangerous living conditions, with the autonomy of where they live and when they move taken away from them. That they are told to pack up and go without knowing where they are going and very little notice. I am sick of people living in countries where they cannot speak the language, where they have no friends and family around them. I am sick of the prejudice, racism and poor treatment that so many of them receive. And despite all of this, what breaks my heart the most is that people choose this life daily to come here and receive that treatment over the life that they have and live in their own country. And more than that, they are risking their, their own lives and the lives of their children to obtain the life that I just described to you. So yes, I am sick of asylum seekers, but they are far from being the issue here. But you have not come here to hear about what I have to say about how broken the world is. I hope you're here for God's perspective on it all. So today I've been asked to continue on our mini-series from another minor prophet, Micah. This is Micah. I'm told that people like to know what they look like. He's a bit of an angry looking man. And Micah's a bit of a weird book, to be honest with you. Um, it focuses on when Jerusalem, no, Israel, sorry, when Israel is split, the north and south kingdom are split and both have broken them, their covenant with God. The leaders are getting wealthy by immoral means. They are promising God's protection for money. And Micah is a, a prophet who comes in to tell the people all that they're doing wrong and what God's gonna do about it. So Micah 2, one to two says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil in their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do so. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them from their inheritance. Micah prophesies the judgment that will come from the Lord and how nations will be driven out of their homes. He also goes on to remind us that God is faithful and he will restore those nations, and he will bring them back into the land that, they promi that he promised Abraham. But God just needs to do away with the evil first. Micah 2, 3, but this is what the Lord says. I will reward your evil with evil. You won't be able to pull your neck out of the noose. I don't know about you, but I feel far more comfortable with the loving and gracious side of God that looks at me when he knows that I'm not perfect and continue to mess up and goes, what are you like? Come on. I'm far less comfortable with the idea of God turning to me and saying, I will reward your evil with evil. You won't be able to pull your neck 
out of the noose. To me, this instantly makes me think of all the very many things that I do wrong and things that I'm not proud of, that I'm so thankful for God's grace on, but not so much his judgment. But God is a just and fair God. Now, if we scoot back to page one in the Bible, it says in Genesis that we are all made in the image of God, set apart from the rest of the animals and God's representatives on earth. Let us just take a moment to appreciate that, shall we? That we have all been made in the image of God. All of us. Whether that means it's the person who speaks too loudly on the train carriage, even though you've chosen to sit in the quiet carriage. Whether it's the person who keeps rustling their sweets in the cinema and just will not be whether it's the person who has caused you real pain in your life and those who are looked down upon by the majority of society, criminals, drug users, unemployed people, asylum seekers, and many more. All humans are made equal before God, regardless of who you are. However, unfortunately, many of us don't, don't act that way. And we are constantly redefining good and evil to take the advantage, to our own advantage and to the expense of others. The weaker people are the easiest to take advantage of. This is what happens in Micah. The same Israelites who are called out of Egypt, called out of slavery in Exodus, walked through the wilderness with the help of God, and now in that very promised land, taking advantage of the weak in society, taking advantage of those images of God. The word for righteousness in the Old Testament is zedekah. I think that's correct. <laughs> this means or is to be understood as the right relationship between people and treating them as the image of God with the God-given dignity that they deserve. Justice in the Old Testament is misfat. Which means that in nowadays, it means if you do something wrong, you pay the price. So if you steal something, you go to prison in an extreme case. But biblically, it means to seek out the vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. More than just charity, but taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social stru structures to prevent injustice. So righteousness and, and justice are a biblical way of life. Some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others of us just benefit from the, from the unjust in society. For example, my friend recently bought a tent from Timu. It was three pounds and she was buzzing. She had absolutely no regard for how it was designed, made, manufactured, packaged and delivered to her door for three pounds. I would hope that the majority of us would be enraged at the idea of slavery, of child slavery, of poor working conditions and abuse. But I, I would take a guess that the majority of us would also be enraged to pay a fair price for the products that we consume. Many of us are slaves to overconsumption and the need for more that that feeds into. We are also victims of greenwashing, of manipulative marketing that mi mislead our, and confuse our decision making. But ultimately, we benefit from that injustice, whether that's passive or intentional. Now, let me just pause here and tell you briefly about some of the wonderful people that I've had the pleasure of meeting over the past year, from prisoners to assigned seekers. So one woman was physically and mentally abused by her husband. He also physically and mentally abused their three young children. She was a high up businesswoman. She told me about the big house she had and the many cars that she drove. Unfortunately, when she told her family that she had to leave her husband, they banded together with, with his family and planned to kill her as it would be less shameful to their family if she were dead than to be divorced. She managed to escape the country and come here with her young children. One guy in prison chapel, when we led worship, thanked us 
and said that it was so great to hear songs that he'd grown up with. His dad is a vicar and he was a youth worker. Unfortunately, when his brother died, brother and best friend died in a drink drive accident, he turned to drugs to numb his pain. And then he turned to crime to pay for his drugs. A friend became a Christian in Afghanistan, so the government planned to kill him. Before that, two of his siblings had died as children as a result of the war in his country. He risked death on his route to freedom. He was away from all of his family and friends when his dad died of COVID, and he couldn't go back home. He has left his vulnerable mother behind in a country where, he is, where she is not safe, in the hopes of creating a stable life here that he can one day bring her into. A man in prison served his sentence and was released only to return six weeks later. His family turned his back on him and his only friends that he had were criminals and drug users. He broke a shop window so he could go back to prison. He told me, I know I'm safer in here than I am on the streets. I've met a brain surgeon who is an asylum seeker who wasn't even able to volunteer in hospital as he couldn't get a DBS with no fixed address. A person at the asylum seeker accommodation had been in the country for nine days when we met. When I asked them what they thought of Liverpool, they said they hadn't left their room apart from a quick dash to get some food. They had been told before they got to the country that they weren't safe and they weren't wanted that if they, left the if they left the accommodation and people found out they were an asylum seeker, their life would be in risk. I was able to tell them that that wasn't true, that they were safe, that they were loved, and he returned an hour later with the biggest smile on his face. But the fact that he believed that to be true before he came here, and he still came here, what was his life like? I have met lawyers, business people, people who can speak multiple languages better than I can speak my own, skilled and intelligent people who are desperate to contribute to, to a society that won't let them. But more importantly, I've met far too many people who are a victim of their own circumstance. I was born in this country, which for all of its many flaws is a safe country. Very few of us fear not returning home each day. I was brought up in a safe town with a family who loved me and were kind to me. I have a safe home, a beautiful home, with a husband who is kind to me, apart from when he's being sassy, is very kind to me. I live in a country where it is safe to be who you are. I've done nothing to deserve this than the good fortune of where my family happened to live. I know this is heavy stuff, but there is hope. We have also been fortunate enough to be part of so much joy and light in those places. One person we spoke to said that he traveled here on a boat with a group of people that he met on the way. They were all moved to Coventry apart from him. He was on his own in Liverpool. We were able to invite him to the weekly kickabout with my husband, and he told us it was the first time in years that he felt valued and a part of something. I've been stood in the pouring rain <laughs> under a dodgy marquee in a car park with over 20 people who hate the rain but are just desperate for community. There is a guy in the asylum seeker accommodation who has read the majority of the Bible and is trying to understand it with his Muslim upbringing. He brings me so many interesting and thought through questions. I can tell you if anyone wants to, it wants to challenge their own biblical knowledge, come along, please. <laughs> to be able to have a conversation with someone in broken language about the most interesting books of the Bible is a challenge and one that I very much enjoy. I've been thanked time and time and again for my visits into prison chapel services because it gives them hope that society having them given up on them. I once commented when we went to the asylum accommodation that it was so great that when we were there, there were so many people out and there's a real sense of community there. To be told by the person I was speaking to who had lived there for three months 
that the only time they congregated outside was when we came on a Tuesday afternoon. It gave them a reason to come outside and meet new people. We may just be offering drinks and a chat, but God's light is so in those places and it's just so encouraging to be a part of. So what are we supposed to do in, those fa- in the face of unrighteousness? The Bible has quite a lot to say about that. Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. Bring about just righteousness. Open your mouth for those who cannot speak for themselves. Jeremiah 22, 3. Bring about, injusti- bring about justice and righteousness. Rescue the disadvantaged and do not tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, orphan, and widow. Psalm 146, 7 to 9. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the way of the wicked. With wars in Ukraine and the world war really not being too long ago, to the, to the riots and terrorism that we have seen in our own city just weeks ago. We really should understand how close war and disruption could be to our own lives. To a death in the family or tragedy striking without the support and love that I hope you have, our lives could so easily be turned upside down. None of us are any better or any worse than each other but our circumstances have so much influence over the people that we become. Now fear not. I'm not expecting you to all go out starting riots, ending riots. It's not helpful and can be dangerous. But it does mean that when we hear whispers from friends, from family, and on social media that speak negative about specific groups, it's so important that we speak up. It's so important that we speak love into those situations. Don't get me wrong, I am so angry about the riots that we've seen in the city and over the country. I have hurt in my life from broken relationships. And I am sick of seeing people feeling less than for whatever reason and how broken the world is as a whole. But I receive a lot of peace that our God is an angry God and that he sees more than we could ever see, more that we could ever know. That he has and he will serve justice to his people. As much as we are called to rescue the disadvantaged and not tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, orphan and widow, it doesn't mean that we're not meant to love them. And it certainly doesn't mean that we're, not, we're called to be judge, juror and executioner. So for those of you who don't know, we've had some encouraging news recently that after trying for over a year, we have finally kick-started our monthly chapel services in prisons. And all being well, in the new year, we are going to start an alpha, alpha course. So it is a very real reality that I could go into this asylum seeker accommodation on a Tuesday to show them God's light and love. And then on a Wednesday, I could be in prison with those people who have attacked, abused, and brought harm to those asylum seekers. So how do I show them both love? How do we show them both love? I believe it comes back to the heart of the gospel. When it comes to God's grace, there is no way that any of us can earn it, and none of us deserve it. When I gave my life to God, I was 17. I came to him crawling on my knees, out of an abusive relationship where I had been groomed. I had nothing to offer God, and I still don't. But instead of telling me that, he told me that I was loved and the daughter of the king. In response to God's, in God's response to humanity's life of injustice, he gives us the gift of Jesus and his life. He lived righteously and did justice, but then he died for us. Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that we too can be righteous. The earlier 
earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness as a gift from God, not a new status, but a power that changed their lives and made them want to change. When we receive the righteousness that we don't deserve, it empowers us to go and seek out righteousness for others and to make their problems our own, to love our neighbors as ourselves. That even though we can, we can and we should be thanking God for the safety in our own circumstances, we should also be getting on our knees and interceding for those broken and dire situations and asking God how we can be his hands and feet and help those people know that they are loved and seen. In Micah, God has told you humans what is good and what the Lord requires from you is to love mercy, do justice and walk humbly with God. It's that simple really, isn't it? So regardless of our situation and who we come into contact with, let's fight to see mercy in that situation. Do justice and walk humbly with God. Because the more we can see ourselves in other people's situations and have our heart broken for them, the more we are able to be an advocate advocate for those unable to advocate for, advocate for themselves. And just as importantly, to love those that see themselves as unlovable and less them. I just want to encourage you all now to just take a minute to have a listen to what God has to say to you. Lord Father, we just ask you, we come before you and we ask you to speak to us. How we can be mercy, justice, and humble right now. Whether that's befriending a neighbor who's been outcast by those around them, writing to a local MP to ask for more support, for asylum seekers or anything else Lord just speak to us and if you're wanting to get involved with some outreach that we do here please do get in touch with me or talk to someone a member of the team whether you want to know how you can be praying and supporting us, I can give you a list. <laughs> or if you have any to spare time in the week, it would be great to have you involved practically. It would be my pleasure to introduce you to some of these wonderful people that we serve and carry the light, God's light, into those dark places. And also, I'd love to pray for us um, that we can have a think about the injustice that we may cause in our own lives. So let's come before God. Lord Jesus, we turn to you for the, for the injustice that we cause, whether intentional or unintentionally. May you bring these things to our minds. when we have harbored hate against someone else. We, are, we ask for your forgiveness and healing in those places, Lord. May you point out those dark, dark places in ourselves and bring in your light. 